Okay, so this morning we're going to talk about neural networks. Um, for those of you who don't already know how awesome neural networks are, um, I've prepared a few examples to show you how awesome neural networks are. Um, so we're going to just like jump through those. So this is SumPy. Uh, full disclosure, I am a contributor to this. Um, I mostly just updated it to like Python 3, so like I'm not like a super contributor. But um, a self-organizing map is pretty cool. You can do a lot of stuff with it. Uh, here are some examples. So primarily it's used to take things from high dimensional space into low dimensional space. Like usually like something like seven dimensions or something down to something like two. So this way we can visually inspect it. So this is an example um, of using a couple variables and a self-organizing map. You can see here that we've trained this and then we kind of like do this view and we look at like 20 different, this is, yeah, it's like 20 different variables. Um, here's a toy example. It just shows you some clustering. Here's some more clustering. I believe this is k-means. So you can see that there are clear like um, clusters for each of the different points of the data, and they've been mapped down to lower. Okay, sorry. Here's the k-means thing, um, and then you can see that they're mapped down to this lower dimensional space. So this is like a pretty cool example. It's like reasonably um, accessible, I think, and you can make really pretty maps with this thing. Uh, so I really like it. It's great for data investigation. Um, so if you're looking for like this actual project, it's sumpy slash sumpy. Um, uh, so it's, oh, sorry, it's, yeah, it's just some pie. It's this guy, Siv, Sivamu. I, I don't know how to say his GitHub username, whatever. Um, here's some more examples. These are also really pretty. I like them quite a bit. Um, you can also use it to do like path algorithms, which is kind of sweet. Um, so neural nets can be used for like lots of really cool things. Um, this is just like one example. Let's go through some more. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the classic uh, word to vec thing. So those of you who may not know, word to vec is actually a neural net. Um, some people talked about it in their talks yesterday, but you may not have heard. Um, so basically what you do is you train a ConvNet and then you pass uh, everything up to the prediction point. Uh, you do all the neural networks pieces and then you just rip off the last piece and then somehow this magically turns into like a bunch of math um, that you can do like really cool things. Like you can tell how the similarity between a woman and a man is semantically. So you have like a semantic sense of, of um, this vectorization. So, um, you can also do like, you can do a whole bunch of stuff. We also saw a talk yesterday um, about this guy that, uh, or about this, this tool that this guy made um, and he took music and turned it into vectors. So you can actually do this on any semantic data point. So like images, uh, audio, text, um, video. Um, I think video would be really cool. Um, or like summaries of video I think would be really cool as far as applications go, but you could also use it on like really weird data things too. So that could be really, really interesting. Um, Another good example is facial recognition. This is sort of like classical. So open face is the um, example that I came to. It's a really good high-level interface for doing facial recognition. Um, it's a CMU project, I'm pretty sure. Um, at least they reference it a couple times. And then here's an example actually using the library. Uh, it's just their demo, but I mean, um, this is like extremely intuitive and really well-structured and gets like pretty good results. So like Steve Carell, Amy Adams, John Lennon, right? Like. And you know you can see the accuracies. Oh, it thinks it's Steve Carell. Okay, so it's not super perfect, but you know it does pretty good on some of these people. I think it depends on the number of training examples. But you can see here how to run this example. Um, so anyway, so facial recognition, uh, neural nets are used for like quite a few things. Um, that's sort of the point. Okay, so does everyone feel sufficiently motivated? If you didn't already know why neural networks were awesome, yeah, yay or nay? I can give n many examples if people want. Okay, okay. So what is a neural net? Um, so loosely, it's just a set of techniques. Um, uh, for doing mathematical modeling. So like there are some clear steps that sort of like happen um, every time you do a neural network. But other than that, you can pretty much swap out all of the algorithms for something else. So even like uh, stochastic gradient descent, which is like the centerpiece, and we'll go into detail if you don't know what that is already. Uh, do you have a question? Uh, not yet. Oh, do you guys want it? OK, you want it now. All right. I assumed after the talk would be fine, but I guess yammering away is like a thing. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna tweet it out. Oh, but you guys don't have my Twitter. Whatever. All right, I'm gonna. Uh, uh, we're gonna do this. Okay, I'm gonna tweet it out right now, and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we're gonna, we're gonna plus this, and then this is my Twitter handle. So, there. Uh, can y'all, can y'all see this? What? I'm I'm making the font bigger. I can't make it any bigger. Okay, okay, okay. How's this? Can people see that? Yeah. Okay. All right, I'll give you like two more seconds to get the slides. Do, 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 do. Okay, I'm done. All right, you know, you're just on your own now. If you didn't do this, then, oh God, why is there a picture of Trump? There's always a picture of Trump. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, he's just the running joke this conference. My God. All right, anyway, so, um, 
Uh, mathematical description of things. All right, I'm going to start over from what is. I'm assuming you all remember what examples look like. So anyway, so a neural network is a um, uh, loosely defined a set of techniques for doing for creating a mathematical model. Um, so the reason why I like to think of it this way is because it makes it feel like less of a shiny tool that's magical and different and like special and fantastic and just like yet another tool in our toolbox. So um, for those of you who don't know, uh, there's linear regression, there's support vector machines, there's like n many tools for doing regression or classification. Um, the reason why neural networks are the new hotness is because of a really innovative technique actually that 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 lives within neural nets uh, called backpropagation. Um, and we'll see that in like a few minutes. But other than that, like without backpropagation, neural nets are pretty much just like the same thing as everything else, except they're like chained models. Um, but backpropagation was this like really crazy, uh, extremely well uh, received idea, and it's been super pervasive, especially as we got to GPUs. So anyway, so okay, um, basically it's uh, a mathematical model. Hopefully, I don't have to motivate why mathematical models are cool. Um, but they are. So anyway, I like to think of neural nets as frameworks, like I said, because all the techniques are pretty much swappable. Um, the way that you kind of work through a neural net is you start with uh, doing the forward prop the initialization, and that's like how stochastic gradient descent starts. Then you do the forward propagation, then you do the back propagation, and that's, that's pretty much it. Everything else can be swapped out. So like the specific type of gradient descent that you do can be swapped out. Um, you don't even need to use that as necessarily. Um, like even like the way that you structure the neural network can be different. Like that's why you have recurrent and convolutional neural nets. Anyway, so enough, enough of that. Um, uh, let's talk about how to interpret a neural net, which I think is like the real meat of this talk and what you should be able to take away at the end of this. I want every single person in this room to not only understand what a neural network is, but actually be able to explain it and then implement it on their own. Um, and I think the best way to do that is to build up the right intuition. Okay, so um, basically uh, there's this idea of uh, linearly non-separable, um, and this is an example of a linearly non-separable uh, like set of data. So like we try to classify with a straight line, we can't because every point here is gonna touch here and we can't use vertical lines and we can't use we can't even like use, so like no straight line will, will completely classify this. However, we can use a series of nonlinear transformations to create a straight line between these two sets of data. And through the propagation of these um, various nonlinear transformations, that's pretty much how we are able to use a neural network uh, to, to get better predictions and better results. We're doing all of these, these matrix operations um, to actually do this. And we'll look at what matrix operations are in detail if you don't know already. I believe I'm supposed to click this, but I don't remember. Oh yeah, so this is just a, a reference to um, explaining the topological background and giving you like further insight. But uh, the big thing to take away really is that you can do nonlinear transformations and there's this topological view of neural nets that is really pervasive and intuitive and it allows us to draw straight lines through data. So basically really what we're doing is linear classification. Um, nothing too crazy. Anyway, now that we've seen that, let's look through um, an example of how a neural network can be used. So this is clearly very nonlinear. Um, I believe this is gonna work. I'm not 100% sure because uh, it's stochastic in nature, so it's not always gonna be 100% accurate. So what I'm gonna try to do right now is learn the orange and the blue. Okay, this is doing pretty good, this is doing pretty good, and done. With 118 iterations using the right tuning parameters, um, I was able to actually get like a pretty good um, neural network that classifies this spiral data set. So this is like super hard for like linear regression to classify, but by using a two layer neural net with seven neurons in one and then three in the second, I was able to do this. And you can actually see intuitively like kind of what's happening. So these are all these nonlinear transformations to the data. And what it ends up with is this wonderful picture that actually gets us what we want. But um, so let's see if this model generalizes. We can pli try playing with this with other things. Okay, it does a pretty good job there. Um, it does a pretty good job there. I mean, I could have gotten to like full, but I just decided whatever, you guys get the idea. So um, let's, let's like look at a second though. Like, is this just gonna magically work with any set of nonlinear transformations or does it actually matter like what we kind of did and like how we trained it and all those other things? So let's just like mess with some of this stuff. Well, I mean, okay, so that, that's now not like basically not working, right? Um, so the point I'm trying to drive at here is that neural networks are a lot still an art form. Um, there are actually new techniques that came out this year uh, for training these hyperparameters that, that sort of live up here. And we'll walk through like most of what these are. But basically, um, an activation function is a nonlinear transformation that you apply to your data set. And that's what's happening in each of these layers. You're applying this nonlinear transformation. Regularization um, kind of like penalizes your data, so it forces it down, so you get less um, of the results overall. Um, the regularization rate sort of says how much regularizing we're going to do. The learning rate is how fast we take in new data. 
Uh, and then like, you know, problem type, so classification. Um, we could have also done regression and then it would have output a number. Uh, and then there's like a whole bunch of other stuff we can tune. But basically this is just like a whole bunch of knobs and levers. Really that's what's kind of happening when you're thinking about actually training neural nets. Um, you're just like pulling at these random levers and somehow you use this art to create <laughs> really interesting uh, conclusions. Of course, the solution I presented above is not the only way to train a neural net and get results. So this one actually also works. It's completely different and yet somehow Okay, it still gets the same solution. Not as quickly, you can see, but like it's like trying, it's trying super hard. Uh, it will get there and, come on, come on, come on, yeah. And it, it gets there. So it's a completely different model, but it still gets the same result. And so like figuring out how to actually get there can be a challenge. Okay, so neural nets are hard. Um, I think it works better on this one. Oh, rah, rah, rah. Ah, whatever, he'll just believe me. Um, but uh, it can be really rewarding and a lot of fun too. Anyway, so. Um, I would highly recommend, um, you know, playing around with these things um, and like being a scientist about this. Uh, so, all right, here's the real conclusion. Neural nets are fickle. Um, unlike simpler models like regression, linear regression or decision trees, neural nets require a lot of care. You have to really try to actually get them to do what you want them to do. Um, and it turns out that actually like they're not that parsimonious. Like, I didn't understand how the heck it figured out that spiral. Not really. I mean, I saw the pictures and still it was like hard. But I think by the end of this talk, you should have some intuition about how that kind of happened. And if you can think about these nonlinear projections and, and transformations and then apply like a linear regression layer at the end, then you can actually get um, quite a bit of information out of this, at least something parsimonious. And this is like a new uh, area in the field. So, so, so hopefully you'll, you'll be able to drive at that any, at the end of it. Um, so. Uh, there are some follow-up questions here, um, and these are just like things that you should experiment with. Um, but anyway, I figure this isn't like too mean because you know you're just playing with like tugging at wires. You're not actually doing any code, so I'm not really forcing you to do anything cruel. But I don't know. Think about this if you have the time. Okay, so let's make our own neural network. That's why you're all here. Um, now that I'm giving you some of the intuition uh, from like an in intellectual standpoint, we're gonna actually just like build the damn thing. Um, so the first thing you need to know is the derivative. How many people took calculus in this room? Pretty much, okay, not everybody. Okay, so super quick introduction to calculus. Um, so calculus is basically the ability to take the instantaneous rate of change um, at a line. So uh, well, give me one second, I'm going to give you a thing, mx plus b. Okay, does everyone remember the linear equation uh, for a line? It's, it's mx plus b. Um, so y equals mx plus b. So the m here, everyone knows that that's the slope, right? So, okay, a derivative is pretty much just the slope at a point. That's it. So it's a way of calculating the slope at a point, okay? Everyone, everyone cool? Yeah? All right, great. So um, there's this rule called the power rule, and you can use it to uh, actually figure out what that, uh, an equation for the, the slope at each point in the line, which is pretty neat. Um, so like if we looked at uh, f to the second power, uh, sorry, x to the second power, if the function x, f equals x to the second power, then we get 2x to the first. Um, so the general rule is x to the n becomes uh, n times x to the n minus one. Okay, matrices. So since there are some people who didn't take calculus, I'm gonna assume not all of you took linear algebra. Um, so linear, uh, linear algebra is super awesome. Um, it, primarily is devoted to vector spaces and the idea of matrices and doing matrix multiplication and a lot of other fun stuff. Uh, it was probably my favorite class in undergrad and subsequently why I studied algebra in grad school. Um, and so like, the, but the main aha moment is just that you can take equations like 5x plus 6y and 7x plus 4y and like do this, sorry, ah, what happened? <laughs> um, you can, um, you can just like create this matrix. So um, this is like just the uh, like computer science-y form of this. I don't know let law tech, um, but basically this is five from here, this is six from here, this is seven from there, and that's four from there. Um, and then you can do things like the dot product. And basically all you're doing when you do, uh, uh, let's say these are single, um, like one, one by two dimensional matrices. Um, so one row and two columns. Um, then you can you just do this multipl matrix multiplication across in this way. So this generalizes to the n case. Um, there's another thing you can figure out the distance uh, of of two matrices by taking the distance of a and times the distance of b and multiplying it by cosine of theta. Um, and that's the same thing as a dot b. So there's like this there's this um, intuitive notion of 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 
in, in, in when you're doing um, uh, neural networks of sort of like figuring out where you are and then adjusting by some distance. Um, and so this is the ge geometric interpretation of this. So, so, so yeah, you can sort of like think about matrix multiplication in this way through this like changing of, of direction and these doing these, these nonlinear transformations, sort of like we did above. Um, and that's where stochastic gradient descent is gonna come in. So we're gonna look at that now. Um, so Newton's method. Um, you could actually claim that like about half of the real power of neural networks kind of came from Newton's method um, because of the stochastic gradient descent algorithm that was first sort of popularized by, by this method. Um, so uh, the basic idea is pretty simple. You start with um, uh, some function f and some, uh, some guess x0, and then what you're trying to do is figure out all the zeros of f. So what I mean by that is you figure out all the places when uh, uh, f takes as a parameter x0 and then, or some x value and return zero. So when f of x equals zero, that's considered a zero of the function. Um, so basically what you're doing is you start off with a guess, and it's just like any guess, x naught. In this case, my guess was just some random number between zero and 100. And then what you do is you just like pretty much um, uh, keep guessing. Um, so here I'm taking the, the, the guess that I have currently, and I take the, dist the, the size of x naught uh, and um, uh, divided by the derivative. So I'm discounting by the rate of change and uh, this is basically how it works. And the reason why it's stochastic in nature, so this is like gradient descent. Um, gradient just is another word for derivative and then um, it's stochastic because I started with a random value. So I'm initializing it randomly. So I will still get to a zero but it won't necessarily be the same one. So if we ran this code, we would actually find that there are two zeros for this function, um, f at zero and f at one. Um, and we would get that stochastically by applying this n many times until we get all the, the roots. Anyway, so um, yeah, uh, that's stochastic gradient descent. Hopefully this algorithm is pretty clear. Um, maybe not like why it works, but that it works and like sort of how it works. Um, does this feel somewhat clear to people? Yay, nay, okay, great. All right, moving forward, onward and upward. Um, here's an explanation of pretty much just everything I did there. Um, and then we can look at this graph if we're interested. I'm not gonna go through that in super detail. All right, so. We're ready now to talk about neural networks. We have all the back background material, maybe not in detail, but at least to some degree. Um, this is actually a neural network. Surprise, they're actually not that complex. Um, this is a single layer perceptron network, uh, and it does pretty much everything you would need to. So I stole this straight up from Andrew Trask. He's super awesome. Um, and he, uh, yeah, he made this really awesome blog post series, highly recommend it and it takes you through neural networks from scratch. However, it doesn't generalize the code, so that's my contribution. Um, I wrote a general implementation of a neural network based off of his code that's significantly, uh, that can, can go you know, n depth deep. Um, okay, so let's get started. So the first thing we do is we start off with two matrices, um, and these are the input matrices, and then we have uh, uh, our output matrix. So like, this is like our x values for our function, this is like our output values. All right. Uh, and then what we're gonna do is we're going to create some synapses. And these are our initial guesses. So this is like the stochastic part of our stochastic gradient descent. Um, and then uh, we're gonna use something called forward propagation. And basically what we're doing here is we're taking this sigmoid function. So a sigmoid function, um, super weird looking thing. It's just, it's this. Um, whoops, nah. it's this. Um, and we're going to chain these, these uh, what so-called layers together. So um, I'm actually gonna go back to my picture of a neural network just so like it's super clear exactly what I'm doing. Just give me one second. All right, here. Um, so the layers are like these boxes, all right? So these boxes, these boxes, these are all layers. This is like the input layer, this is like the first layer, this is like the second layer, and this is the output layer. So, sorry, let me scroll back down. Okay, so these, synapse, these synapses, these randomly initialized things, these are actually all these lines in between the boxes, okay? So they're actually not that scary. It's just like um, matrices. They're just matrices of a certain size. So um, if you guys don't know, matrices aren't commutative, so you actually have to like preset what the sizes of your different matrices are gonna be so that they can interact with each intermediate layer. So your synapses, or the lines in between each, transformation layer, um, and each layer have to match up. Um, so that's the reason why I preset this to three, four, and four, one, because this is, you know, three 
by four, and so this has to be three by four, and this is four by one because this is uh, one, and the thing it was getting was a four by four matrix. Okay, so that should be super clear, just uh, matrix multiplication. All right, so then this is back propagation. We're, 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 we're pretty much ready. Um, so uh, here what we're doing is we're looking at Y, which is the final output, and we're subtracting L2 from it, um, and then we're multiplying, uh, this, is, this is the sigmoid uh, function, I believe. Anyway, so, um, sorry it's early and I'm like slightly forgetting, uh, but yeah. Um, basically, this is just like the error at um, the, the last layer. So basically what we're doing right now is we're seeing, okay, this is the actual output and we're seeing how much we were off from the actual output from what our guess was. Um, that's what L2 is, it's our guess. So remember, Y is just a constant. It's the thing that we defined above and it's what our actual output should be. Um, and then this is, this, is, this, is our, this is our error term. So we're subtracting our error term, or we're multiplying our error term by, by this, and then we get the delta, so this is the difference between um, L2 and then, uh, yeah, and Y. And then we take the, the, the error from, from, from the previous layer and we multiply it, we dot it, um, by synapse one, uh, which is like this thing that's gonna get us back to here, right? So, um, and then we just to multiply that by the, the sigmoid function. Okay, and then we update our synapses um, accordingly by, by multiplying them by the transpose of uh, the, the, the amount we were off by. So this is how the propagation happens forward and backwards. We're just doing matrix multiplication and then we just like, we're just like taking a derivative. Um, so the derivative may not have been like super clear like where it was exactly happening. Um, it'll be clearer in like the general thing. But anyway, at this point, you should be able to, to see the, clear, the steps somewhat clearly. There's initialization, forward propagation, and then back propagation. That's it. That's all there is to neural net. So um, if we generalize this code out, then uh, the initialization step becomes create connections. Um, here I'm actually creating my neural network with, so like, I don't know, I just think this function is clean. Um, basically it creates n, n many layers, and this is like the real innovation that I'm bringing. I mean, I'll, there'll be further things you'll see in a second. But basically, um, by creating a, 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 a n, n size neural network, we can make our networks arbitrarily deep and arbitrarily wide. Um, this code uh, doesn't actually um, allow us to make it arbitrarily wide. There's a, another iteration of this code that does, but this will allow us number of hidden layers to arbitrarily make it arbitrarily deep, which is actually what turns out what matters. The number of nonlinear transformations that you take, um, so like, like the the, the, the depth of this, which would be like the number of hidden layers, this actually turns to, to be the thing that allows us to make infinitely more complex models. For some reason, width doesn't really matter that much. At least that's what the paper that I read said. I didn't fully understand it, to be honest. Um, anyway, so uh, the next thing, forward propagation. So this becomes, okay, so first we set up the actual sigmoidal function, um, and we have something that allows us to, to do the derivative. Uh, this is probably not the best way to do this. I should probably just have like a nonlinear uh, function than in, like derivative nonlinear function, but whatever. So then forward propagation becomes, so we haven't done the derivative yet. We don't do that until back propagation. Let's just be clear on that. Uh, we look at all the, eh, why does that keep happening? Um, we look at all the layers, then we iterate through each synapse. Uh, just so we're clear, the synapses are these line things. And then uh, we update our layers by doing a transformation, a nonlinear transformation specifically, and then we dot, so we multiply the layer times, the, the previous layer times the current synapse, and that's what gets us to the next layer. And so then that's why we're appending this to layers. So we're doing um, layer i minus one times current synapse that gets us to layer i, and then we do a nonlinear transformation off that. And that's it, that's all forward propagation is, um, at least in this scheme. All right, so now we're ready for back propagation. Uh, strap in, this is about to get a little painful. Um, so back propagation, it turns out, is a little, a little ugly. Um, this is not the cleanest implementation that I've seen, although I cannot find the cleanest implementation I've seen. I meant to copy it down and I just forgot to. Um, basically, the idea here is we're gonna apply the derivative at the delta layer. So right now what I'm doing is uh, I've got all these errors, uh, and the errors start off by looking at the last synapse uh, minus the last layer, okay? Um, so basically what I'm doing here is I'm taking the output and I'm subtracting the, the, the last layer and then um, uh, each error will be multiplied by the nonlinear transformation with the derivative. So this is where the derivative actually happens. It only happens once. 
uh, and it's being transform it's transforming the 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 layer at position i, and then these the the um, the multiplication of the errors times the layer with this nonlinear derivative transformation gives us a way of getting closer and closer to bounding towards um, a solution to this. And then everything else around this is sort of like not fluff. It's all important and necessary uh, because you don't just need the errors. You actually need the deltas. And then you need to do a dot product with the delta times the synapse. And that's what was happening up here. Um, in the end case, this gets a little ugly. And then you have to um, update all your synapses. And that's what this is. So that's, that's this step. OK. Um, I know backpropagation is a little ugly. Um, it's always a little ugly, but I mean, this is like 20 lines. Hopefully, you can parse this if you look at it hard enough. And remember, it's just this. So if you can understand this, then this should not be like impossible to understand. Um, anyway, so what do we get? This becomes this. And this is pretty OK. Like, I think anyone can understand this. So even if everything in here didn't make all the sense in the world, um, hopefully the idea of applying, taking our neural network, which is our synapses, right, and then um, doing forward propagation of all of those to get out our layers, and then doing back propagation on our synapses and our layers to get our neural network back and the current error, and then uh, basically checking what our error is at each level. Uh, should be relatively intuitive. So we do have some time, um, and I'm going to go through some demos. But if anyone has any questions at this time, or like if anything was super unclear, I can go back and answer specific questions um, about like what I did specifically. But if no one does, then I'll just do like um, basically the talk that the extended version of the talk because I got through the material faster than I thought I would. So any questions about what I went over or what I did? Um, any confusion, anything super unclear to any degree? If you wanted to learn more, where would we go? Um, so uh, this is like a great example of like I think a minimal neural net. Um, if you wanted to learn more, I would highly recommend reading Andrew Trask's blog. Uh, that would be the first place I would go. Um, then I would check out. Uh, my references, uh, that should be on three separate lines. Sorry, guys. Um, so this guy has the best theoretical explanation of neural nets that I've like ever seen. Um, I actually literally just stole this picture because I think it's the most intuitive one. Um, and this is like uh, like word to vec kind of stuff. And then Wild ML um, is really good. He really likes Theano a lot. He does some NumPy things, but he really likes Theano a lot. Um, and also, uh, so the other thing I was going to recommend Sadly, Coursera has taken down a lot of their stuff. Um, they had a class on neural networks with, uh, I believe it's George Hinton or G Jeffrey Hinton, or I'm not sure how to sp spell his name, but he's at uh, University of Toronto. And he, um, and I mean, now he works for Google because that's what happens to all the artificial like uh, intelligence, like super monster guys who are like badass. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, he, he gives a class on neural nets, and it's like super, super, super good. But um, if none of this stuff made sense, if you are still scratching your head and you're like, ah, this is hard, um, I'd highly recommend uh, Gilbert Lestrang's uh, MIT OpenCourseWare course in linear algebra. Um, it's like the best thing ever. I, I actually didn't even like attend my lectures, and I went to a pretty good school for math. I just like, well, I, I attended my lectures, but I, I, I watched these. these. This is how I learned linear. Um, and then um, I'd also highly recommend, um, what else do you need? Probabilistic graphical models is really important. Um, yeah, so uh, PGMs is super important. Um, OK, this is like not the right example. I don't know. They just search for probabilistic graphical models. Um, that's basically what neural nets, so like the computer science view of neural networks is more or less probabilistic graphical models. Um, they see neural nets as a generalization, although I feel like it's a confluence of a lot of the sciences coming together, like uh, linear algebra and calculus, so physics. Um, and really this kind of, I feel like, kind of came out of CERN and a lot of really hard science. And it can't really be pointed to by one specific thing. But that's like personal perspective, just like seeing them evolve. Anyway, OK, cool. Any other questions before I go on to more fun stuff? Yeah. Um, so first, I'm going to make a couple of statements just to 
Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, great. Yay! That's super great. Okay. Oh yeah, like a ton. Okay, so um, yesterday someone did a talk on, um, so okay, so I want to posit one thing. If you're going to build your own neural nets, uh, you should be really like okay with it being kind of hard <laughs> uh, to, to, to do like with real accuracy. Um, but I would, I would highly recommend um, so uh, someone did a TensorFlow problem yesterday, and they basically did like handwritten rec like hand handwriting recognition, like uh, number recognition. Highly recommend that. Um, the open face thing that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, they have a bunch of data. You can just like kind of take that and then use it for whatever. Basically, um, neural nets are really good for supervised learning. So anything that's supervised is going to be super useful um, for this. But also, I mean, Kaggle competitions. There's like n many of these, right? And they all have data sets, and they're all cleaned, right? They're ready to go. Um, you can also use the scikit data sets. I think Pandas has some data sets. Like, uh, yeah, we're living in an era of big data, so like, if you want to play around with these things. And like, the nice thing about Kaggle competitions is they'll actually have the neural networks like, all set up, so you can see what someone else did. And then you can be like, oh, can I do better with my own implementation? I mean, that's kind of like how I got into this a little bit. And then it just got a little out of hand. <laughs> that's how I'm speaking to you all now. Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, actually, since we do have like twenty minutes left still. Um, if you guys want, I can take you through some advanced features in neural nets. We can kind of just like go through um, some of the more advanced stuff. Okay, so this is going to be like off the cuff, so I apologize if anything I say is crazy. But before I do that, um, I do want to show you one example of a neural net in practice doing something absolutely ridiculous. Uh, so this is uh, a neural net that someone else wrote that plays Mario. <laughs> yeah. Do, do, do. Oh, this is like the bad one. Oh, uh, no. I can do better. Hold on. I'm going to get a better example. Um, so I didn't write this one. Uh, this is someone else's. What is... Okay. Uh, let's just do play and see what happens. Okay. Oh, okay. This is me playing. Shoot. Okay, hold on. I'm going to cheat for just like two seconds, and then we'll actually look at the example. Uh, what is it? It's this guy. No. Mario. Yeah. Okay, here we go. So this is like his example of like a thing. Where is, oh, maybe we have to go to advanced. Uh, that's right, I took, okay, I took the wrong one. All right, so I want this guy, I want this guy. He's, it's like a little scary how good this thing works. Oh, could not find main class, oh, that's why. Yeah, I doubled up on my Java. Yeah, okay, cool. So this guy is a little terrifying. Like, you don't want to run into this dude if he's like a soldier out on the battlefield and you're fighting him, because he will like straight up own you to death. <laughs> um, so like, this is just an example of something that I really enjoy doing, uh, <laughs> is like playing with these things and just kind of watching it be terrifying and like straight up owning the world. OK, OK, enough of that. So um, whoops. Uh, so that's actually what I'm going to show you right now. Um, so it turns out that you can use neural networks uh, in, in, in congruence with another technique called uh, Q-learning. Um, and I'm going to explain Q-learning right now. So hold on to your hats. Let me get to it, though. Meh. Different slides. Uh, oh, gosh. Too far. One second. Oh, no. You're not going to have any. Oh, whatever. Um, so this was another talk I gave on neural nets. Um, Okay, reinforcement learning. So 
Um, one of the things you can use with neural nets is something called reinforcement learning. So um, right now, we've kind of looked at some examples of supervised learning. You have a lot of training data, and then you have um, a lot of test data, and you can verify your results, right? Well, what happens if you don't, if you can't do that last little step in the backpropagation, you don't actually have something to check against error rates? How do you like know whether or not, or how or what to do with your model to update it? Enter Q learning. So this is um, unsupervised. Uh, it's called reinforcement learning um, because uh, you don't actually train it the way that you would. And well, it's not actually technically unsupervised. It's technically just called reinforcement learning. So what happens is, a object is acted upon, and then it learns positive and negative reinforcement, and then takes actions based on that. So we're going to see an example of this now. That's what this algorithm does that I've written up. Um, but yeah, so so uh, unsupervised learning is when you don't have any training data, and you're just kind of figuring out patterns. It's more exploratory uh, data analysis or machine learning. But anyway, okay, so reinforcement learning. So let's 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 check this out. So um, choose action. All right, so we're gonna model this off of the idea that you're in a game like Mario, uh, and things will happen to Mario, like he's gonna get stepped on, people are gonna kick him, his dreams are gonna be dashed, he'll never grow up to be what he wants to be, the world will slowly grow in on him. I'm sorry, I was trying to make a joke. Uh, so that's like a negative reinforcement. Um, it's way too early for me still. Um, and then positive reinforcement would be like getting all the mushrooms, getting all the coins, getting the princess, kicking Bowser's ass, all these important things. Um, so, uh, Anyway, you have this representation, and this is just a dictionary, and this tuple is like the state, the current state, and the action. Um, and so when you update, when you, when you apply the representation, uh, or like when you take the index of state action uh, on the representation, so remember this is a dictionary, so when I'm, I'm, words are failing me, when I do uh, this, like, Say, when I, when I, when I, well, okay, well, yeah, yeah, fine. And then when I do, when I do that, that's, 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 that's what's happening here. Um, there just may not be a value in here, and I didn't know that dictionaries had this thing called get, so I wrote a method that does evaluate, and it just, like, does a try catch. Um, but that's basically what I'm doing. I'm doing get on a dictor, uh, on, on a dictionary. Um, and then I remove anything that doesn't have a value already, and if nothing has a value already, so that means mean I would have an empty list. Um, return to me, that's what Q is, it's like, that's what they name the list, that's why it's called Q learning um, in the algorithm. Then I choose a random action. So, um, and actually a better version of this would allow me to just like randomly choose an action sometimes anyway with like some low probability, but that's like a more advanced thing. We won't worry about that for right now. Anyway, so um, in Q learning, what you do is you take the max Q. So assuming, that there is not just some random choice and we actually have learned some things and we know when positive actions have happened to us and we know when negative actions have happened to us. So we know what to stay away from on average and we know what to do on average. Then we take the thing that is the best for us. Um, pretty simple, right? But using this and then applying it within the context of a neural network. So um, where we did our error term, oh crap, I moved off those slides. Hold on, give me one second. Uh, okay, I'm going to leave this up and then I'm going to, yeah. Yeah, and then I'm gonna do this. Okay, two seconds, almost there. Okay, so, okay, we're gonna look at the little case because little case is easier to understand. Okay, so when we did this delta two thing at the end, right, um, and we like updated based on some error, instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna update based on this like choice of Q, right? Okay, so everyone with me? Yeah, okay, so we're really not substituting much, we're just kind of substituting this. Okay, so this is like obviously like a really naive way to do this. There's like more sophisticated things uh, you can do, but this is the basic idea of Q learning. And so using this, um, uh, we can actually think of a lot of ways to update our representation. So I did like the dumbest thing possible uh, here. Um, Oh no no sorry sorry I didn't I didn't explain that so this is this is the choosing action but how do we actually update the representation well to update the representation um, we can do something really dumb where we take the current value and then some alpha and then some reward so like um, this is usually a number less than one but greater than zero and it would basically say okay we got some more reward let's like be skeptical that this is actually a good thing but let's update our current value a little bit for that state action pair. Um, if it doesn't exist, then we'll just create a reward. So this is like the most naive thing you could do, uh, simple decay thing. Um, but we can make this really advanced. So this is like, 
uh, a sophisticated method for updating. We could take uh, the mean, um, uh, or we could, and this is like, this would be actually playing a game. This is just Q-learning, no, no neural nets here yet. Um, but um, we, can, we can do this like, generate a board, if we're playing like a regular board, and then we can choose an action, we can update an action. Um, what I wanted to show you though, where's the median? Median, okay, cool. So we can also take the median of this. Um, as you can see, update representation just happens the same exact way. Um, yeah, uh, so, so there's like lots of strategies for doing this. Actually, a really, really interesting strategy would be taking like um, the distribution of values and then doing like a cosine distance between things, you know, figuring out a way of, of, of using like the histogram of, of values to actually inform uh, how you update your representation and how you choose which value to do. That's the most informed way to do this, and it's usually the best, but it's also the most uh, time consuming, right? It's the most cost costly. So because you're storing way more data, and you know, like let's say you have to run this a billion times, which you usually do with reinforcement learning, I'm not kidding, like usually like around a billion times, um, you end up with like uh, these really expensive things. So you know, there's some, there's some like intelligence in compressing this down to just like an a, an, a simple average um, or a simple expectation. Um, but you know, if you have like GPUs and like crazy big super cluster, um, then you can make super badass things by taking the distribution of all these things and updating your representation and then doing lots of really sophisticated histi histogram type analysis. Um, so that's the at. Okay, um, now let's look at the implementation of this in a neural net. Uh, so let me get out of here. Okay, deep. Oh, actually, before I do that, so uh, now that we've kind of seen this, and we've seen an example of this, let's just like look at another one, whatever. You know, whatever, whatever. So this is, uh, this is Flappy Bird. Yeah. So this is actually using Q-learning and a convolution neural network. Uh, the convolution neural network is learning the pixels around Flappy Bird uh, and keeping him safe. <laughs> uh, so it learns where the errors are or the dangers are over time. And you can actually see, like, uh, if we zoom out for a second, the state that it's in, the action, and the reward, and then, like, the max Q. Um, so this is, like, straight from that. Um, and we'll look at the implementation in a second. But um, just enjoy how, how wonderful that is. He hasn't died yet. Like, he just keeps on going. He's, 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 he's just, you know, he's just chilling. He's just chilling. So um, there's a reason why, why, why this little flappy bird guy does really well. He can only take one action, okay? Um, well, one or two actions. He can either, oh God, stop, stop, it's live. He can either, um, there, one sec. He can either um, press a button to flap or he can not press a button to flap. And those are his only two actions. Let's, let's just take another example to, to prove to you that, that, the, the, that our uh, evil, Machine overlords are not here yet. The singularity has not happened. It's, it's all fine. Um, so let's watch this thing play Tetris. I guarantee you, you could beat this engine uh, without very much effort. So as you can see, our neural network fails to even get past level one, yet it tries. It tries so hard, but it cannot succeed. It is a true sadness that has happened to him. <laughs> Uh, poor Horatio, I knew him well. Anyway, um, so, um, or is it York? I don't remember. Okay, so um, what we can see from this is that when the number of actions that uh, a neural network can take, specifically the number of actions a Q-learning algorithm can take, um, it, it, it's gonna suck a lot more. So how, how, do, you, how do you deal with this? Well, um, I actually came up with a, I believe, a novel way of dealing with this. So um, we're gonna look at that right now, uh, if I can remember where I put it. Uh, where did I put it? Uh, okay, give me two seconds, give me two seconds. I think I know, I think I know. Two, uh, no, wait, what, what? Oh, I'm in, okay, that's why. Oh, let me try lectures. Are you in here? No, you're not in there. Okay. No. Where are you? Decision trees, data mining. Okay. Um, I'll just explain the idea because I cannot find it. Um, the idea is pretty simple. Actually, it might be in here. It might be in here. And then I'm going to give up. And then I'm going to give up. 
Oh yeah, okay, cool. Wait, maybe, is it Paul? Yep. Uh, Newton's method policy URL, is it this guy? No, it's not. No, it's not, oh wait, maybe it is. Update state, no, this isn't right. <sighs> okay, I don't know where the code is, it's somewhere around here. Um, the basic idea is pretty simple. What you do is you uh, do a restricted set of your possible set of action pairs. So like, let's say you had eight actions, you would restrict yourself to two or three possible actions that you can take, and then you would learn on only those two to three actions, assuming that every action gets you from point A to point B, right, every action pair. So you would find a minimal set of action states that get you from point A to point B, and then you would learn on only those. And then you would uh, sort of loop through all the possible uh, action pairs that allow you to, uh, or action state subsets that allow you to do this, and then uh, you just, you, you end up um, uh, picking the one that does the best. Um, so there is an example of this somewhere. I have to dig through my code to find it. I'm sorry, I wasn't expecting to give this talk today. Um, otherwise, I would have had it available uh, and ready to go. Um, so I'm not sure exactly where it is right now, but yeah, it's in here some, oh, maybe it's down here. No, it's not. Ah, where is it? Where are you? Oh, wait. Oh, wait, no, is this it? No, it's not it, it's not it, it's not it. Okay, I don't know where it is. It's somewhere in here. Anyway, so um, that's reinforcement learning. Okay, I don't think I have enough time actually to go through the convolution neural neural net because I have about like eight minutes left and that's really not enough time. Um, okay, I'll stop again for questions if anyone has any about reinforcement learning um, since that's not what we're expecting to cover. Uh, and if there isn't any questions, then I'll go through like drop out or something for like five minutes because there's enough time to do that. Okay, any questions at this time? Where can we find you? Uh, Twitter is pretty good. Uh, I put it up before. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, all my, all my, all my stuff is just like literally my name. So just like, I'm vain like that. Oh, 14. Wow. Okay. Some people have been saying some either nice or mean things about me <laughs> during this talk. <laughs> this may be the end of my speaking career. Well, that's okay. Um, but yeah, so this is how you find me on Twitter. Um, other questions? Um, you can also email me. Uh, my email, shockingly, is just like, just my name at Gmail. So, like, pretty much everything is just like, I got, I, I got very lucky. I got all my names at all the things. So, if, if there's like a service that I use, yeah. Okay. Anyway, other questions? Okay, drop out, and then I'm gonna bounce. I think that's appropriate, actually. Okay, so uh, let's do neural nets more. Uh, uh, I think it's in neural networks. Yeah, I name things well. I totally do. Okay, uh, let's do drop out tunable backprop. Okay, cool. So, okay, this should all look familiar. We basically are doing the same thing. Um, the reason this is a little different is because now we have the depth and the breadth of the hidden layers. This is like that update that I was talking to you about for it before. And then we have the backpropagation. Cool, cool, cool. And then we have this tuning thing. And now, oh my god, here's all the stuff. <laughs> uh, so this is depth, breath. Where's my dropout? OK, here we go. So um, yeah, this is going to be, oh geez. OK, this is a little bit more complex than I remember. Um, OK, just going to explain it. Um, the high level idea that's happening here is we're taking a random number from a binomial distribution. And then we're deciding whether or not to keep uh, the nodes at that layer. And we're doing one minute. OK. Oh, there's not enough time. All right. Come, come ask me after if you're interested uh, in, in, in Dropout. Um, but yeah, OK. All right. So I'm going to conclude now. I'm sorry that things didn't go exactly to plan. Uh, I was expecting this to take a different amount of time for some reason. I think it's early, and so I was talking too fast. Um, but yeah, thanks all for listening to me rant for the better part of an hour. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs>